Uh, this is Rick Harnish. I am the executive director of the High Speed Rail Alliance. Uh, we are a nonprofit advocacy organization working for fast, frequent, and affordable trains all across the country. Um, we have three program areas. Research, we want to make sure we are the most knowledgeable advocacy organization out there. And then all of, we use that knowledge to educate public and especially elected officials and policymakers about why we should have high-speed rail and what steps we can take today to make it happen. And then third, we give you, our members, the tools you need to communicate additionally uh, with, with policymakers and elected officials and the, your friends and family. Uh, we're about to launch our year-end membership challenge. So if you found this or other activities we've done uh, helpful to you, please help us get members. Uh, initially, you can make a donation today by hitting the join us uh, button on our main homepage, hsrail.org. So uh, Sherry has a uh, presentation on a simulation software and modeling for railroads um, that I am learning about today um, along with you. So I'm excited about this and, and Sherry, I'll let you take it and explain more about who you are and uh, what your model does. Thank you. Absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone, or morning, depending on which time zone you're in. Uh, I'm in California, so just to let you know, it's a beautiful morning here. The fall is gorgeous here, so I really appreciate the morning uh, meeting. So thanks again, Rick, for scheduling this at this time. Uh, let me just give you a brief introduction about myself, but I would like to then ask the participant to let me know uh, what type of uh, backgrounds they have so that we can address their questions or we can do that later after the presentation, whatever works best for you, Rick. So um, my background is I'm an engineer from way back when, been doing engineering work in linear transportation and infrastructure. Uh, here and there, uh, about 20 years ago, I focused on rail and rail systems. When I joined the Bay Area Rapid Transit and uh, worked on their extension to the South Bay. So um, I was working for BART as an employee and I had to create new policies and standards and everything in order for us to uh, figure out what would that mean to the operations of BART uh, when they extend because their central control system didn't really have the capability to analyze any of these things. And at the time I struggled, and this is 20 years ago, I struggled to model how we're gonna operate a new train system that is gonna be an added extension that's a huge extension for BART. And how do we actually figure out the timelines, energy usage and everything else? And it was about a year of uh, really prototyping and modeling single lines and everything else. And at that time I said to myself, wouldn't it be nice to have a model that you could actually run different scenarios and look at the different types of train sets that you could buy and what would be the impact of that on the overall system. And 20 years later, well, a little less than 20 years later, uh, in 2017, I had the privilege, and I want to say it that way, to work with some brilliant Spaniards with uh, Renfe. And I was introduced to this program in its early um, development. And this program basically allows you to model what trains you have, any types of trains. If it's a freight train, whether it's a rail, uh, high-speed rail, whether it's a metro system or a local city um, system that is gonna interconnect into a mesh. So I wanna take a few minutes to tell you about this, uh, what we call a multi-track um, simulation. And from there, uh, if we have time, I'll show you how easy it is to actually model it. So uh, with that, uh, if anybody, I don't see questions, so uh, Rick is gonna moderate all those questions and I'll go forward uh, with the presentation. 
Yeah, All right. So so, I should have mentioned um, uh, type your questions into the question and answer, and, and we'll get to those as they come. Excellent. So what does this software do really? It's a very advanced operation simulator. So you can actually put very little data in there and get some real good results and reports out of it. So you take the um, alignment, you take the engine and the types of cars you have, you look at operational modes, you look at dwell time, station areas and all the things that you could have and you can model all of that and you can actually get results like how long does it take for a train to get from one place to another? What is the travel time? What is the speed? What is the energy consumption? And anything related to that. And what we really um, see with this model is that you get a sense of what your decisions, uh, the impact of your decisions. One of my favorite things is that in the planning phase, you can actually look at how changes in your alignment and your profile is going to impact your operational modes. So uh, let's talk about that. Uh, so one of the things that we see uh, for what we have used this software in Europe all over uh, is that you can look at it for planning, you can look at it for design, you can look at it for operation. And based on all of those things, you can actually figure out what's the best suitable um, level of uh, engagement for inter system the integrated systems and i apologize for the phone ringing there's lots of ringing over here <laughs> so all right um this is what the problem is when you work from home <laughs> COVID time so um the other thing that i want to mention is that once you can model each of those items like if you look at the high speed rail and then you look at the freight rail and you look at the light rail you can have different models for each of those, and then you can create a project, what we call, to see the integration of those. It's a much more sophisticated part of that circulation and project development for this model. So to me, the model actually has uh, five different things in it. So you can actually do alignment analysis, you can do train um, engine analysis, you can do time analysis, you can do energy analysis, and then you can bring it all together and integrate different systems and see the impact of operation. If you have a single or double track that you use for multiple type of service where the conflicts are, and it actually helps you solve some of the conflicts. So it's been used internationally, and I, you know, lots of people in Europe and Middle East are using it now. And I wanted to bring it to United States because it's a, a system that anyone can use. It's open so people can purchase the software and use it at their, uh, as they wish. It's not something that you're uh, required to have the consulting firm run for you like the current scenarios that we have in United States. Uh, software that is basically used here, there are four of them that are all proprietary. So if you wanna use it, you have to actually have uh, a lot of information in there. So in this case, it's very user-friendly. And as you can see, you put some of the input data in there, you get uh, a lot of information out and you can actually look at curves and data and reports. And one of my favorite is really about the CO2 footprint and how that works. So uh, really, if you look at the mode of operation and the impact of that, it, it gives you a lot of good data for good decisions. And what I really advocate, frankly, is making decisions based on good data. So this is some of the reports that you can get. So this is like a profile. It shows you where the stops are. This is, uh, I'm sorry, this is the alignment. Uh, this is the profile. And that kind of gives you the curvature. This is the speed report. So some of these are reports that you can get out of the system. This particular thing is very important and I wanted to emphasize it because when you input data about a locomotive, whether it's a um, um, electric or a DMU, uh, the data that is related to that locomotive is something that uh, my colleague in Spain has been collecting all over. So for all the work that he's been doing, he's been collecting a lot of this data. 
And some of that data is available as a user to use. So that's something that um, to keep in mind. For instance, the Caltrain modeling is a diesel and then they're going to go to a EMU and you can see the difference between uh, the speeds. You can look at the uh, existing operations, the diesel operation for the transition. And then you can look at the EMU and how that is going to change the timeline and the service. And okay. this is basically, yes. I'm sorry, can we go back one? Uh, okay, let's see. Let me go back. Okay. Yes. Okay. So what is the pink here? I'm sorry. There's so there's three color lines. There's pink, blue, and red, correct? Yes. So these are the different uh, curves for the different um, modes of the train. So these are the, the um, if you look at the manufacturer's data, mm -hmm. the manufacturer gives you these this information. And this is what is incorporated into the model. Okay, okay. Sorry about that. No problem, sorry. Okay, here we go. So what we get then as a result uh, is this what we call the mesh. And this is the daily operational strings for the trains going and coming. And you can see this is like a uh, train that is going from Madrid to Barcelona. And as I had a pleasure of actually riding it, and this is a high-speed rail. And in this scenario, you see what other trains, that the train, each train has its own color. So if the train is going and coming, it has its own color and it tells you the modes of operation and potential conflicts. And these are at the different stations and it basically allows you to see where there are potential conflicts in this scenario. And what we did with the folks um, in Spain is everything, of course, in Europe and the Middle East is on kilometers. So the effort that we've taken in the last year and a half is to actually convert everything to the American standard so that we could actually run these models and <laughs> use the data based on our system. And so we can work with uh, the operations center. We can work with the analytic data that is provided. We can actually get the string charts and help modify the simulation and figure out how to solve the conflict issues. And this is one of the things that I am a proponent of based on my experience working for both uh, BART and working with Caltrain. Because as you know, if, uh, folks don't know what Caltrain is. It's a rail system that goes down the peninsula from San Francisco down to San Jose. And just recently we actually managed to get extra funding for its operation because we're going to electrify it. And the electrification and all the road crossings, whether it's great or not, there are some conflicts that we need to look at. And one of the things that allows us to model that, it looks at all of those things. And then of course there's UP freight that goes there at night. And so all of these things are helpful to look at the operation center and figure out how you're gonna operate and having the simulation available before you change your operations in the control center, you can see the impact of that down the road and how that uh, change of operation can impact. You can use it for operational uh, assessment and control, but my main thing is that you can really get the data, how to do it and how that would impact you long-term uh, or short-term. So uh, <clears throat> one of the other things that I wanted to mention, and this is one of my favorite parts because that was my challenge at BART, is that you can actually look at the electric consumption. now. This chart shows you the um, consumption on the green side, and this is a regenerative system. So you can actually capture some energy from the EMU in this particular case, it's a uh, high-speed rail from Madrid to Barcelona, and it, you actually have energy generated from the braking. And so the recovery is calculated in the overall uh, system. So you can see the impact of the energy use uh, from the beginning to the end for a particular operation. And the thing is that you can look at it per direction of the energy. So you can look at it going and coming because you know, that has a different impact. And then the final thing is that when you look at the aggregate of every train, all of it together, that helps you decide how to set up your substations and it can actually help you figure out what are the substation areas that you could um, collect, you know, like this is one substation. 
and then you can decide how to size it, how to operate it. And then from there, I wanted to take a few minutes to uh, show you something if, uh, if my uh, screen would allow me to do that, because uh, if you let me uh, try that out, that would be really helpful. So uh, I wanted to run this little thing for you that shows you how you actually put the data into the uh, system. So let me pull that up and see if I can. Bring it over so you guys can see it. Abri. So, um, and I don't know if I can make this any larger. Let me see if I can. So uh, I can't make this any larger, but let me see if I can expand my screen for you guys. Oh, shoot, it didn't like that. Okay. All right, so um, so here is basically the screen that you will see in your software when you open it in Multitrack, and you can uh, upload. Uh, you can upload the design system if you have your uh, alignment. I'm not sure if everybody can see this very well. Can you see this uh, very well? What happens if you hit the two arrows down at the bottom? Next, this one? No, over the next to the gear. Down this at the, one. Right next to that, those two arrows there. there you see we, it better. There you go. Oh, good. Thank you for helping me with that. So <laughs> this is this is the elevation here. <laughs> so. What we're showing you in this little uh, area is it's visualizing. You can actually look at the profile and the super elevation data. Uh, this allows you to see where your potential areas of difficulty is for operations and, and manages your risk a little bit better. And then you have routes that you can model. So you can have the same route modeled with minor modifications so you can see this alignment. Uh, and how that is set up with uh, what you have. You can add stops to it, uh, and then you can actually use the software to uh, decide what type of energy, uh, you know, DM view. This is the um, diesel operating system that they're using for this particular simulation. And so this is the curve I was showing you earlier. And that's what they're using to upload into the system to then calculate the speeds uh, that would come out. And so there's a lot of data that gets uploaded for each of the um, engines. And that's really helpful. And there's a lot of, I don't wanna go through all the details, but basically you can then upload a little unit. And this is literally, that the video is showing you exactly the time that you take to actually put this information in there, how long it's gonna take for you to actually create a unit. And then, as I mentioned to you, there are some projects that you can add different uh, trains into a scenario analysis. And that scenario analysis looks at a single track or a double track. You can create along the side. Um, if you wanna bypass something, at a station, you can create that in your analysis. You can <clears throat> work through um, how that information is uh, presided. And so you can name it. And this is uh, the part that is very simple. You can create a simple analysis. And one of the things that I really liked about it, and I think Rick and I had talked about this earlier, was the universities. And in the time that a lot of the kids are doing online learning, this is a really good tool for the universities so that they can actually see the impact of a modification in design that they're contemplating. If, if because of environmental reasons, you have to make the curvature one way or the other, or you have to um, make sure that um, the profile is uh, modified in a different way. This gives the children, I call children, the young, young adults in the universities 
to um, uh, grasp the impact of those decisions because you can make one little change and see the impact of that all the way down to the operational time frame, the speed, and the energy. And then you can really accumulatively see the changes that you're making and then how all those changes can add up to a lot different operational model that you had anticipated at the very beginning. And because of that, it's a, a good way of looking at uh, opportunities there. So this particular uh, area is actually showing you there's the, he's inputting a siting in there. So you can see uh, how the line will show there's gonna be a, a new siting, a schematic. So now this, this, this is bypassing the station, right? So you get in here and then there's a bypass. And so it's changing this scale so you can actually see it. Uh, there you go. So you know if you wanted to bypass the station, you could set it up like that. And one of the key things for a high-speed rail is that in terms of operational flexibility, you want to have the ability to uh, move the trains through some of the stations without stopping. And that's one of the factors that he's like putting in here. It's like, what if I change the operations, if I put this in here, what will happen to the operational system for particular trains? And can I avoid some conflicts later on if I didn't stop over here? So this gives you a lot of flexibility looking at a particular options that you have. And you can build a model small uh, in little incremental stages so that you can start with a single line, um, looking at your uh, space and adding this uh, level of uh, complexity one by one. And I think, um, I know our time is limited today, but uh, the idea that I wanted to share with you is that if you look at a single uh, line and you look at the operation of the, that one particular DMU, this is a diesel one that he's putting in here, and then you can actually model one of them. And then you can say, I'm going to duplicate this multiple times. I want to duplicate it so that you have multiple trains going. Now, in this particular case, the maximum speed is 110. So it's kind of similar to the Caltrain model that I was talking about earlier. Because depending on what you can do based on your stops, the maximum speed is 110. You can go any further than that. Uh, right now, most of the road, the alignment is experiencing about 79 uh, miles per hour maximum speed in Caltrain. But when you change that, when you look at the multiple trains coming and going and the impact of just not just one train, but multiple trains going on the same alignment that get returning, you can model it very simply because the alignment is set, the train type is set, and then you just basically duplicate and create a, a run what I call a, a circulation model uh, for multiple trains running for the day. And that basically gives you the departure times and arrival times. And this is exactly how long it takes to do a simulation run. So it doesn't take that much time. And that's why I wanted to show you that if you really look at it, this is the actual time it takes. So it's like less than a minute. And there you have it. So now you can look at your reports and see what you have and you can modify things if you want. And I think this <clears throat> particular color, if you see that one, it kind of shows you how one particular one is one color and then you can change it. You have a different train with a different length or whatever, you can change the color so that you can see the differences uh, when you're doing your run analysis. So this one is uh, doing them. So you can show the difference. So that's exactly how long it takes to kind of look at something modified. Uh, so it's a very robust model. It runs uh, very effectively. And uh, I usually use it on my uh, laptop. And so it's very effective. Uh, you can take it with you, you can have it in a meeting, you can discuss the issues, uh, you can present it. So I think the main attraction I have is that it's not only fast, but it is really based on the data that you give it, 
uh, fairly uh, effective in helping you make the good decisions and how to run the system. So now he's going to show you the studies, the result of that study. So you ran the model. You can now look at the energy consumption. This, this is one of the reports that we generated for diesel. And so you can see how much energy you get uh, used during the day. And that's your uh, footprint. Now, if you had an EMU, it would actually give you the electric consumption and help you analyze where you would put the substations and how to put all that stuff together. Uh, but I want to do a quick check with Rick in terms of our time, because I know our time is uh, limited. So I just wanted to show you some of these things. How are we doing with time, Rick? Excellent. Um, so we've got uh, basically two questions asked twice. Uh, so Bill is asking, uh, one, um, does it allow for high speed conventional and freight trains on the same section of track? Yes. Um, and similarly, it allows for electric and diesel on the same section of track. So you can set it up that way. Yes, you can. It, it, it will allow the same profile for both of those to be used. And then you can see the conflict between a diesel and an electric when they get to the same station about the same time or they're in. If the diesel train is too slow for the high speed rail or electric train. So you can do the analysis and see how if two trains start with a, let's say five minute headway and one of them is faster than the other and it's gonna catch up. How do you have to bypass them and let one go around or one stop and all that? You can, you can do all of that modeling in there. Okay. And then two questions um, around weather. So um, sometimes weather can change the speeds, et cetera, especially here in the U.S. where yes. uh, with such heavy haul railroads, they really limit the speed during heat. How does the model account for that? So you can actually set the limit. Uh, actually, in this screen, it says, you see that it says speed limitations or I'm pointing at my screen here. It's a speed limitation set. Yeah. So you can actually set the limitations from ranges or stations. So you can set the limitation because you say, in this particular area, we're too close to a very uh, slippery area because of the snow during this part of the year. I want to limit the speed for that particular range uh, of um, speed. You know, they have to be different, right? You know, so you can actually set the limit. And when you do that, uh, when you run the speed model, it will actually show you that it could go faster, but there's a limit. And that's exactly what I showed you with 110. You, the, the train could get up higher, but we had to set the limit for 110 for the Cal train because of the way uh, the laws are here. Okay. Um, and then, Alan, I don't quite understand your question, but um, I'm assuming that different dispatchers have different, he's saying, how do you account for dispatcher preferences? So I'm assuming that one dispatcher sometimes prefers to put everything on track one, um, and, but another might be more flexible in runarounds, et cetera. Yeah, so you can actually model whatever the dispatcher preference is if you're looking at it as an operational tool and you can actually change it by the time of the day and how you would operate the headways from different tracks. Because what I was showing you basically is single and double track. But when you really think about what we have modeled for the high-speed rail between Madrid and uh, Barcelona, is that you have multiple tracks and they're uh, sightings that basically allow you to operate different ways during the whole day. And from my experience, what we have done in France with the work that I've done with the TGV, you have a whole different scenario that you model for yield management. So there's a whole different uh, way of modeling uh, yield uh, if you want to, but this not, you know, you can modify this model to give you different number of trains at different times and minimizing the maintenance requirements, but that's interfacing with other models. 
I was just showing you the basic model of how easy it is to you, for you to get information uh, on an alignment and how you can build up your model from simple things and having the same train go back and forth, go back and forth on a single line, or you can have multiple trains, the different uh, headways, and then you have this uh, analysis. This is basically the electric uh, consumption he's going to show you on this particular line. It's like now you have the electric unit study, and it gives you the consumption on the screen here. And then from there, you can actually look at the substations. And it helps you figure out optimized substations versus you can actually tell it where the substations are, and then they can work through that. Um, and then uh, is it flexible enough to have, like on the holidays, you would have longer dwell times in stations because there's a lot more people getting on and off the trains. Absolutely. And one of the things that I really would like to use this model for is for game days around here. <laughs> because, <laughs> because when you're on this platform and there's like tons of people standing, you got to give them more time to get on. So you have to change the dwell time. You, you can change the way you run them. Uh, like after COVID, BART doesn't run the same scenario, right? And so you can change and optimize your operations based on what you know the behavior of your patrons are. So for a game day is my favorite thing. You know, when you have, we used to have like um, Warriors in Oakland. Okay, when you have the Warriors games here, you got to make sure that people have plenty of time during those periods. And then you have to add trains for to getting people out. So you can do all that and see the impact and the timing and the, um, the mesh, what I call the time and speed mesh. Uh, so that you can see the impact of that on your operation. Um, and then uh, David is asking, what are the season modes? So the season modes basically has to do with the heat uh, consumption. So in this particular thing, you're seeing the electric um, engine. So in, as you know, Spain gets really, really hot in the summer. <laughs> So the electric consumption for air conditioning in the units goes up. So um, then you have the winter mode, which is the heating goes up. So it's calculating the potential temperature uh, balancing within the cars and additional energy used to do that because it's an electric system and okay. you're drawing electricity for the air conditioning units. Excellent. Absolutely. Yeah, we, there, there's all sorts of things in here that I haven't covered, but I wanted you to see actually the whole thing uh, run. And this is a substation um, energy consumption that is showing you what happens with this model. This is my favorite part, being a total engineering geek. <laughs> <laughs> no. so it's like it took me so long to figure this out when i was designing these things 20 years ago it was like oh god i need to figure this out and it took so much time and effort i was like i wish i had this <laughs> <laughs> no, if i could uh, travel time i could take this back 20 years ago <laughs> um uh, so Alan has another question. Yes. Um, how does does this get into the business side of it so that perhaps it's providing operating costs and um, can you put passenger loads and revenues into it or is that something separate? So you take the reports that we generate and you do that data analysis uh, outside of it. So there is a information about energy that you get and that's basically you can take the energy reports and look at the cost of all the energy that you're using so the operating costs can come out of that um but uh, there is this uh either oh, somebody just uh put something over here but uh there's a set of reports that you can get out of here that will help you input everything to another model and i wanted to actually mention this because the data here is so standardized 
Uh, we can input data for alignment from any GIS system. You can output any of the reports into an Excel and run any other thing that you want to do. So there are a lot of the data standardized format so that you can manipulate it the way you need to. Okay. Um, and then I'm assuming Lance, you mean that they, they run. So Lance has asked when the catenary repair workers turn off the wires to fix them, does this system turn off in the part of the maintenance? I don't quite understand your question. So, um, I, you know, for a catenary system, I'm familiar with some of the work we did um, elsewhere. I was up in British Columbia with some of the work that I did up there. So if you have maintenance scheduled for catenary systems and for whatever reason you cannot have the EMU run through that section, right? Uh, one of the things that you can do is to model um, the closure of that section of the track for the EMU, and then you can run the DMU through all of that stuff, right? I mean, that's one way of looking at it. And this, this actually is showing you right now a mixed use. You have the DMU and EMU running on the same track, and it's running all the uh, data for you in here. So that answered the earlier question that somebody asked. Uh, and so for maintenance activities, and this is something that we did at BART, because there were very few patents during the um, COVID, they ran trains up to a certain place and then they bust people from one place to the other and then ran the rest of the train from the other side while they were fixing the track uh, in that area. They don't have a bypass system at BART. And BART is the Bay Area Rapid Transit that I was mentioning. So you can actually model uh, the trains uh, and figure out what would be the frequency of a bus to, between the two closures, the, the two stations. So that can lead into the timetable that you need to run the buses. Okay. But um, it, the buses are not modeled in here. Um, could you model the bus as a really slow train? Uh, I have never tried that. Uh, okay. I guess what we could do is basically create a um, situation where, see, for me, I don't like doing that because when I look at a train, the train has to come back in my model because if I allow it to go slowly through that, if we weren't single tracking it, I could take that train from point A to B at one speed, from B to C at a much slower speed because single tracking it and then going but I need to make sure that that train comes back because of my operational simulation. If I show it as a train going through that area, then I have to bring it back. And if I basically say that the train stops, then it stops. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. So now you have that. I'm going to have to uh, stop this because it's going to keep running. That can you go back to the string chart in your presentation? Sure, let me close this. Um, and then Fred is asking, um, can you use it to pick uh, the ideal fuel mix uh, for, uh, I'm assuming Fred, you mean uh, biodiesel versus diesel or something like that. Can you use it somehow to, to compare different fuel types? Uh, so we have the EMU and a, um, hold on a second. It's, uh, I set it on rerun, so I have to stop it from running again. Okay. <laughs> Bear with me, because as you know, I have the two screens and the two screens don't always like to work together. <laughs> okay. All right, so um, let me answer one of, what was the question that, now that I've got that out of the way, let, let me answer your question that I get the uh, presentation back up. Can you input various fuels and sources of energy to pick the ideal fuel option for a given selection of motive power? So uh, if you have the DMU, if it's a diesel, or a different type of, uh, let's say, 
around here, since I'm in Berkeley, California, we have these uh, uh, oil, re recycled oil fuels that we're considering for a lot of things. <laughs> if you had the data for that, if you had that alternative fuel, right? Uh, mm -hmm. If you have the data for the engine, then you can put that in and you can analyze uh, the, the impact of each of those um, on your operation in terms of energy consumption, in terms of the speeds that it allows you. So that's part of the engine. So you can do an analysis of engine types by using different engines and analyzing which one has what speed, and then you can compare the reports if that's what you're asking. That makes sense. Okay, so I'll go get uh, my presentation back up as you requested. I closed it for ease of managing. Sorry about that. No, no. I, you know, as as you and I talked before the presentation, I have these two screens, and they they do funny things here. So. All right. So. Here's my presentation. And so you wanted to go where to? The screen chart. Okay. Let's go to the screen it, chart. Okay. Here. Yes. And this has, okay. this has nothing to do with your presentation, just something I I love. It's <laughs> down, down between uh, Calatayud and uh, Madrid there, they've got these pink lines. Those are commuter trains that run at 150 miles an hour. Yes. And I, I'm just fascinated that they have that. And I wish we could, uh, I've been trying to find a way to explain how you could have, you know, a 220 mile an hour train running from Chicago to St. Louis and then a, a commuter train that just goes as far as Champaign or something. Yes, absolutely. That's the beauty. That's the beauty of this model because you can have different types of trains on the same track and you can see the impact of those um, on your operation. So uh, one of the most favorite aspects of this uh, model for me is that, for instance, if you were uh, experiencing a what we call a conflict here, can you see right here? Yeah. There, there's a train going and a train coming and there's this other thing happening here. And so this, if the, it shows, it, it'll alert you to a conflict if there is a conflict in operation. And then it will solve the conflict for you by changing some of the operational perspectives. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, and I, yeah, it's one of my favorite things about, I mean, I am so in love with this software as an engineering geek, uh, as I said, if I could take myself and this software back in time 20 years ago and redesign based on this model, the way we would have done the design of the extension of BART to into San Jose, I would do it in a split second because it will change the way uh, the entire system would optimize. And this is the thing about it, this is optimization. This is all about performance optimization. That's what PRO stands for performance optimization uh, for rail. Cool. Um, I, I, and again, nothing to do with your presentation. JR Central, the main dispatcher has to draw the string line by hand every day. Oh and, my goodness. And even though they, it's all automated, they do it in order to force discipline of understanding what's going to be happening that day. <laughs> Um, God bless. <laughs> oh, I would. I mean, when I had to do that with my modeling skills uh, 20 years ago, uh, I was frustrated and I was modeling it, <laughs> doing it by hand. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to ask if we have a little time, if I close the presentation, I don't see any of our participants, if they could talk about who they are and what their area of focus are would be really helpful. Um, yeah, close your presentation. Now, I have never done this before. Okay. So this will be a good test. So if somebody wants to talk on camera, put your hand up and I will turn you on.
And the question is how, do, okay, David Phillips, allow to talk. Um, so oh, there you are, Mr. Phillips. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. No, amazing. This microphone is very uh, uh, finicky. Some, uh, most days it doesn't work. Um, the, uh, yeah, so I work for Trans Systems, consulting engineers and planners uh, and architects. And uh, so we have a, a modeling group uh, also uh, based in California that does a lot of rail work. Uh, and uh, so this looks like a good tool. Um, the, do you have US customers yet? Uh, we have been talking to uh, customers for providing uh, service to them, uh, but I would like to actually sell the software to folks so that they can do whatever modeling they want on their own. So uh, that's where we're at. We've been doing support, but we'd like to actually sell the software at, that, at this point. And you have my information, I think, at the end of the presentation. I don't know if you guys caught my information. I, no, I, no I, I haven't gotten that yet. So I, I'd like to, uh, I'll, uh, I'll record it uh, if uh, Rick puts it back up. Uh, do you want to put it on the chat? <clears throat> Where would you like me to put it? Yeah, put it in the chat. Okay, so here's um, my, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Okay. And then let me see. So David, I assume we're finished. Let me see if I know how to uh, disable talking. Okay. Anybody else like to put their hand up and have a question or et cetera? So I just put my email and my phone number for everyone on the chat. Okay. So that, does, does it go to all the panelists? I, I don't see anybody else except you, Rick, so. <laughs> um, let's see here. It went to all panelists, which is not, um, I can email it out afterwards. Um, how do you, to all panelists? So, um, if you go to all attendees. Ah, there we go. All yes, I can do all attendees. Okay. Because I can't seem to have access to all attendees, but you do. Yep, there it is. Okay, you got it? Um, yep, Alan says he got it. Okay, anybody else wanna put up your hand? Any more questions? Um, Alan Stash is saying he's an avid rail passenger, Metro, Regional and Amtrak, and really wants to see high-speed rail. <laughs> me too, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and then you had said that I can see how this would be a good training tool because it's not as complex as the others for college students. Yes. Yeah. The thing I like about it for the college students is that like I've worked on other rail models and in order for you to even start, you have to put all the data in. So it doesn't really simulate anything till you put an entire data set in and all the attributes. Here, you can start small. You can just do a single line with two stops, one train, and have this train go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and it just kind of see what happens to that train. Okay, excellent. Um, anything else? Okie doke. Well, thank you very much, Sherry. I really appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. And uh, if anyone, uh, if you can send me the list of the participants, I can uh, share some of the presentation or anything that they want, I can email it to them. Uh, whatever works out for you guys. So this was great. Okay. And happy holidays. This is fantastic. I, was, I wasn't sure people were going to be leaving for the holidays this Friday, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm sorry I was uh, ill before, but I'm so glad that I got to see everybody, or great. at least you. <laughs> <laughs> Take Talk care. You Goodbye. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great holiday season.